rock star, spaceman, hero to millions. When Chris Hatfield took command of the International Space Station, he inspired a new generation to reach for the stars, and he made Canada very proud. We were lucky enough here at the National to talk to him while he was in orbit, but we and you had so many more questions. And now that he's back on solid ground, he's had some time to reflect on his life-changing experience. Chris Hatfield sat down to talk with us this morning. Here's an excerpt from that conversation. Everyone knows that you were a, a social media rock star as a result <laughs> of your flight and, and ever since. The other day I went on, on Twitter and asked, you know, I'm going to be talking to Commander Hatfield. What, do right. you, what would you want to hear from him? And there was a torrent of questions. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I've isolated a couple, and it's interesting how many of them are concerned about like the kind of the you know what are you going to do now right um and especially so because i think they know your story since yeah. you were what nine years old you wanted to be an astronaut yeah and you worked your whole life towards that goal yeah you've done your three flights you're out of astronaut the astronaut business at least the uh, the active astronaut business so they're asking questions like you know wade johnson says do you feel you've reached your professional peak uh, with ISS command. How do you top that? And Rebecca um, Southern says, what's next? You know, what's next for Chris Hatfield? I think externally it probably looks like that, like I reached some sort of peak. Like my wife, my life was sort of trucking along like this and then, ah, commanded a spaceship and now that's that's done. And that that is uh, entirely a uh, an externally imposed perspective. I focused really hard on trying to be uh, a good engineer, then a good pilot, good test pilot, good astronaut. I don't spend a lot of time going, well, you know, back in whatever, 1985, I intercepted Soviet bombers that were um, threatening North America off the coast of Newfoundland. That was a really important thing. It was in defense of our country. It was demonstrating the capability of our CF-18s at the time. And it was a big peak in my life but it, it didn't define the rest of my life. And I don't sit around on my porch going, man, I wish it was 1995 or 85 <laughs> again. That was just a thing that happened. You've taken some of those experiences and, and turned them into kind of a motivational lesson for any number of different people, including Canada's Olympic athletes. What's the lesson from your life for them? I think if you view crossing the finish line as the measure of your life. You are setting yourself up for a personal disaster. There are very, very, very few people win gold at the Olympics. And if you say, if I don't win gold, then I'm, whatever, a failure, or I've let somebody down or something, then what if you win a silver? What if you win a bronze? What if you come fourth? What if your binding comes apart? What if the, you know, what if Lufthansa doesn't bring your gear? What if all those millions of things that happen in life happen. And, and only a few people that, are, that go there are going to win gold. And it's the same to some degree, I think, in commanding a spaceship or doing a spacewalk. It's a very rare, singular moment in time event in the continuum of life. And uh, you need to honor the highs and, and the peaks and the moments. You need to prepare your life for them. But recognize the fact that the preparation for those moments is your life. The, and, and in fact, that's the richness of your life. And anybody who goes to the Olympics shouldn't say, uh, hey, I, I was at the Sochi Olympics. I would be much more interested to hear them say, I prepared for the Sochi Olympics for 20 years. And these are the things that happened. And, and these are the things that I learned. And when I got to Sochi, it was great. I mean, and, I, and I did my race and I, whatever, I placed eighth or first or 92nd. But the challenge that we set for each other and the way that we shape ourselves to rise to that challenge is life. You know, it wasn't until I read the book that I realized that you have a form of vertigo. Hmm. You, Chris Hatfield. <laughs> Iconic <laughs> astronaut. Yeah, the CN Concerned Tower. about heights. CN Tower makes me uncomfortable, sure. Uh, I think you should. Spacewalker, Chris Hatfield, <laughs> no. afraid of heights. I think you should be afraid of heights. I, th I think if, if you don't have a natural fear of falling off a cliff, then you're probably going to fall off a cliff. It, it sh your body should resist letting you stand somewhere dangerous. You should have a fear of, 
of charging rhinoceroses and, and a fear of, you know, sharks. I think that's a good fear to have. Yeah, uh, okay, but <laughs> you're well, out there on a tether. Right. Spacewalking. It's, it's a mind game, right? Um, you're afraid of heights, but you're, you're not really afraid of heights. What you're afraid of is hitting the ground. If you go up a, a 60 story building, if you're inside the building, so where you don't have any windows, you lose perspective that you're now, whatever, 600 feet above your normal ground. So you can do the same thing on a spacewalk. However, when I first came outside, and, and you're only holding on with your hands out there, there's, there's, you're not like clipped on you know, with some structure, you have a little clothesline attached on a reel so that if you let go with your hands, you'll float off and slowly get dragged back in again. But when I first went outside, I was holding on tight, and I, I had to consciously, you know, if, if I could have seen my, my, my knuckles, they would have been white, I'm sure, just from grabbing on, but the inside the gloves. But um, after a while, you start to look around and realize that it's not that you can even fall to Earth. You and Earth are going around the sun together. It'd be like thinking you were suddenly gonna fall to the moon or fall to the sun. It can't physically happen. The two of you are going there together along with the spaceship. And instead, the world then becomes um, something that is traveling through space with you. And as soon as you can make that mental shift, that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on the 60th floor, but I'm, in, I'm not gonna fall, then your hand starts to relax. And after a while, I actually completely let go, just flying along with the spaceship and myself and the world. Uh, going around the sun, and that was probably the best moment of it all, the perspective of that aloneness of some of our first steps away and seeing the world for what it truly is, this big ship moving around the sun, going through the universe just like we were. All right, let me try and get uh, a couple more of these Twitter questions in here. Chris Lowen. Would you go on a mission to Mars, even if it meant never returning? Talking about it philosophically, uh, I'd start with just the straight practical question of how? How are we gonna get there? What's the real vehicle? Is that something I'd wanna commit my chances to? I don't want a one-way trip to Mars where I die in the first 10 minutes. You know? <laughs> I wanna have a reasonable shot of getting there. However, if I thought that there was a spaceship that could actually take us to Mars and land us safely on Mars, and then when we landed on Mars, there was a way to build a little bubble that was habitable, you know, oxygen and everything, then you're at a pure philosophical question. And then it would just depend who I'm going with. Cause we're all sort of on a one-way trip, right? If you look at it, it's just a matter of how many people are on your crew. Who do you include? Some people go live in a in a little cottage somewhere and spend most of their life interacting with hardly anybody. And some people live in the middle of a city. Um, in the history of humanity, we've had a lot of one-way voyages as we've left home to go settle someplace new. And uh, I think depending who I was with and, and even more importantly, the ship that was keeping us alive, yeah, maybe. Is there other life out there? Uh, we. You know, people think they see stuff in the sky all the time, and people would really like to, to know for sure if there's life in the universe. We don't know conclusively. We're looking on Mars, you know, despite all the popular movies and things, we haven't found life yet, but we're looking. To think we're the only planet that managed to develop life is sort of um, an arrogance, I think. To think that life is flying through the universe and coming all the way to Earth and sneaking around and, and finding us fascinating, to me, is also a form of arrogance. I think the odds are overwhelming that there has to be life in other places. Uh, but the real puzzle is, how do, you, how do you prove it? How do you go visit? How do you communicate? How do we, um, how do we travel those great distances? Uh, and we haven't figured those problems out at all. But if we can find life on Mars, and, and that's what the robots are looking for, then we'll know the answer to your question. And we'll know that we're not alone. And then it just becomes the question of uh, how do you build a better rocket ship? In preparing for this, I went through the CBC archives to find uh, everything we've done on you uh -oh. over, over the years. <laughs> and uh, there was this wonderful uh, profile done by Hannah Gardner on the Fifth Estate ah. uh, in the early 90s before your first flight. She went down to Houston, yeah. saw you and your family. Um, 
And there's a great little quote of yours uh, near the end of the item where uh, I guess she was asking about what it was all going to mean to you, uh, having this opportunity to, to be up there. And you said, hey, I'm just as confused about life in general and the reason we're all here as anybody else. And you said, hey, you know, I'm just as confused as the next guy about what all this means, about, you know, the meaning of life, where we came from, right. how we got here. Are you any closer to being able to answer those questions, having had this kind of experience? I've had a uh, tremendous privilege of perspective that, that almost nobody has had. When you talk about the meaning of life, we tend to think about it as life on earth. And uh, to be away from the planet for a long time and to be able to see it constantly out the window uh, allows you a... a uh, a reflection on it that is really hard to get just in regular day to day. So I think if there is any sort of meaning of life, it's got to be very personal. How does the life that you lead affect your own conclusions about what's important to you? Because I was sent sort of as an envoy uh, to go to this place and see the world that way and, and report back, I've tried to do my best to uh, capture and share the experience real time. You know, I took thousands and thousands of pictures of the world and, and told people why I thought this was important to me each time. Um, tried to share the, uh, the wonder of it and, and the, uh, the new perspective on ourselves uh, of our shared existence on the planet. And I'm still that same guy who Hannah Gardner talked to all that time ago, and, and there's still just as much randomness and confusion to it all. But I think the six months I spent off the planet gave me a greater peace and, and patience and sense of uh, eternity of the whole thing and, um, and, and a great delight in, uh, in seeing the world through other people's eyes when I come back now. And, and comparing notes on it all. But I'm still learning. We'll, uh, we'll see what comes next. On that, we'll, uh, we'll leave it. It's been a treat, as it always is. Really lovely to talk with you. Thanks. Thanks. Well, there's actually a lot more to that interview, including your questions. You can watch it in full this weekend on one-on-one. -on -one. And if you haven't heard yet, you'll be seeing a lot more of Chris Hatfield right here on The National. He's joining the CBC team on television and radio as a recurring contributor. We're all looking forward to having him here.